Good morning. How are we doing? <laughs> Practicing moose calls. Thank you. Not making fun of anybody who likes moose. I'm just saying it sounded kind of like a call from a moose. Boy, this is how it's going to be, huh? Is this how it's going to be this morning? You better, you better strap in because it's going to get really, really fun in here. Uh, we are <clears throat> in 1 Peter chapter 3. And uh, so, as Michael said, if you would crack that open. I don't know about you, uh, not this morning, but the last couple of weeks I've been able to, you know, get down and, and be in, in a time of worship. And I don't know if I'm the only human being that ever, like, sometimes gets so passionate and so excited about worship. And I just, you know, in that moment, you know, Caleb's leading us and just let things go. And my heart's opening up and I want more of you, God. And, and maybe I left like a really bad week like I did a couple weeks ago. And, and, uh, and, and I'm just like totally just, oh, I'm in your presence. Oh, God, this is amazing. And, and we sing great. Oh, I love that song. Oh, I'm so glad that the worship team like telepathically read my mind and knew that that was the song that they were going to play this morning. And, and I'm worshiping. And then you get to this point where like, you know, like there's things that we do all the time. And then there's just like the musical creativity, like sometimes we add an extra four beats or eight beats of rest, but the worship team doesn't tell us in advance. And so like, you know, we're getting there and, and all hail King Jesus. And we sing a song and we get back and we know it's coming. We know it's coming. We go, oh, and we're the only one who sings it. And you're, and you're like, you, you got two options. You can either pretend that there's like a physical that, some, that you're one of those people that sometimes just yells things randomly for no reason. And, and you just like keep going and keep singing. Or maybe you're just like one of those people that you're just super spiritual. You're like, I'm just going to pray this over everybody right now. And I want them all to hear it to how holy I am. And so you just belt it out loud. Or the other one is that you like start really high and come down low. It's like, go oh, hell, King Jesus. Oh, God, please don't let anybody see me. Oh, hell, the Lord, of, this is awkward right now. Oh, and, and you're thinking like, okay, I just came in, and I have had such a horrible week, and I just wanted to leave everything behind me. And God, here's this moment where I'm pouring out to you, and I'm connecting with you, and your presence is here, and the worship team's kicking backside and you're doing all this stuff and and all of a sudden I'm like oh God, why do I have to suffer why why is my heart I feel like everyone's staring at me there's like knives being tossed across the other I've ruined someone else's worship time because I didn't know that we're supposed to wait eight beats when normally we only wait four beats and dang it Caleb what's your problem I just suffer and everything is against me. So we're in 1 Peter chapter 3. And uh, we'll come back to that in a moment. For those of you who don't like whiplash and sermons. So I'm, what I'm going to do is what we've been doing um, throughout this series. We'll read a section. We'll explain it. Read a section. Explain it. This is so, so, every week is so important. This week is really important in terms of context. So we have to really, really dive in and make sure that we are reading what we're reading and we're not adding or subtracting from God's word, but just let it soak in how it's written to us. So starting in verse 13 of chapter 3, it says this. It says, now who will want to harm you if you are eager to do good? But even if you suffer for doing what is right, God will reward you for it. So don't worry or be afraid of their threats. Instead, you must worship Christ as Lord of your life. And if someone asks about your Christian hope, always be ready to explain it. But do this in a gentle and respectful way. Keep your conscience clear. Now, Peter's writing this letter and we have to remember that Peter was alive when Jesus was alive. Peter was alive when Jesus called him to be a disciple. Peter was alive and he heard the tone. He, he heard the emotion. He heard the times when Jesus was frustrated. He heard the times when Jesus was trying to celebrate. He heard the times when, when Jesus had to confront people. He heard when Jesus was full of compassion and, and his heart broke when, when, he, when, when other people were walking away. That he was 
was alive when Jesus was being beaten, that he was alive when he died, he was alive when Jesus came back out of the grave, and he was alive when he rose in what, what Christianity calls the ascension, when he was on the hill and, and his followers watched him go up to heaven. He was alive when Jesus was alive. And, in, and because of that, he also knows what it's like to suffer for his faith. There were times when the Jewish leaders, the spiritual leaders would look at him and say, you, you were born and raised in that area, in that Galilee. Nothing good can come from Galilee. He was flogged. He was whipped. It, even Jesus himself said, Peter, <laughs> you're going to die for your faith. Now, some of us, we desperately want to know the end of the story. You know, I have faith, so God, I just wish you'd give me the next eight steps. Well, Peter got the end of the story. How would we respond if we knew the end of our story and if it were something like that? Peter understands what it means to suffer for his faith, and he knows that at the time, there was not persecution in the Roman Empire. There was persecution from the Jewish spiritual leaders, whether it was in Jerusalem or as in other areas of the Roman Empire. But there was nothing that was driven from Rome. See, 60 to 62 AD-ish, that's about the time that this letter was written. Peter is beginning to see the stove, which is... Rome, and he's beginning to watch this pot with water in it, and it's turned up to high. And you know, because if you've ever made macaroni and cheese or any other type of pasta, and you're waiting for the water to boil, you know the different fit. You can see the, kind of the currents where the molecules are a little bit faster than others. You see the currents, and then you see like these little teeny tiny bubbles, and they begin to form, but they're not rising up yet. And you know that you're close to boiling, and that it's going to boil over when you see the tiny little bubbles just at the bottom, and they're just sitting there. And and this is what Peter is seeing in the Roman Empire. It, they're beginning to persecute people because of their faith in Jesus. And he's beginning to see these little bubbles. He knows what's coming. And he's already lived through it. And he knows that the people that he's writing to, they haven't. And so Peter is saying, look, I'm someone who would experienced suffering for my faith. And let me tell you that, that by giving your life to Jesus, it means that all of these things that, 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 that you hold on to, yes, you're a child of God. Yes, you're a co-heir with Christ. Yes, as we talked about earlier, that you're a royal priest, you're a member of the royal priesthood. Yes, you've been brought from death to life. Yes, yes, this is what Jesus did for you. And we, and we the, the, the people who are reading this letter are like, yeah, Jesus gives me that identity. Jesus gives me that identity. But Peter's saying here, hey, we got to remember that Jesus was persecuted for his faith. And this is something that associates us with him. That there, there could be an opportunity where we suffer for our faith as well. And Peter's just trying to help them understand, like, you can't accept the positive and reject the negative. If you're going to be a follower of Jesus, you got to take it all. And I know if we can just be real, I mean, we're in real life, so I, you don't really have a choice. Um, I know that some people, they grew up in church, and some of the denominations or backgrounds, like this was preached hard. Suffer, suffer, you're going to die for your faith. Some people went as far as if you didn't suffer for your faith, that uh, you weren't really a follower of Jesus. And I just want to really come back, let's come back to context for a minute. Let's not read anything into it. Uh, this, this, what I'm about to share is exactly the reason why I am not on any Christian television and I don't preach on a weekly basis in front of a TV screen. Because this doesn't bring drama, okay? So if you're looking for drama, this is not the church for you or at least the sermon for you. But let's read the first two sentences together. It says, now who will want to harm you if you are eager to do good. But even if you suffer for doing what is right, God will reward you for it. Let me tell you what it doesn't say. It doesn't say that every single person who believes as Jesus is going to suffer for their faith and die. The most powerful word in these two sentences is the only word that has two letters in it. If. 
Which means Peter is saying, look, it's coming in our empire, and if you suffer, don't be surprised. Now, normal people probably won't cause you any harm because they see that you're doing good. But just so that you're prepared, just so you're not surprised, don't be surprised if you suffer for your faith. So let's stop with the scare tactic, and, and uh, you're not going to hear that everyone is going to suffer for their faith. Can we agree with that? There is an opportunity that Peter's telling the people here. There is a, uh, there is a chance, but I am not going to stand up here and say that if you don't suffer, you're not a real believer. I can't say any more than that. I'll lose my job. But there's no drama in that, that scare tactic. So let's just move on. Verse 16. But do this, answer about your faith, in a gentle and respectful way. Keep your conscience clear. Then if people speak against you, they will be ashamed when they see what a good life you live because you belong to Christ. Remember, it is, because, it is better to suffer for doing good if that's what God wants, than to suffer for doing wrong. Christ suffered for our sins once for all time. He never sinned, but he died for sinners to bring you safely home to God. He suffered physical death, but he was raised to life in the spirit. So he went and preached to the spirits in prison, those who disobeyed God long ago when God waited patiently while Noah was building his boat. Only eight people were saved from drowning in that terrible flood. This is where you say, what in the world did we just read? That made no sense to me. Let's just condense it down for sake of time to two things. One, control what you can control. And two, if you don't know the story, there's a story in the Old Testament in a man named Noah. Noah, generations after Adam and Eve, our collective humanities, our first mom and dad. They were Created perfect, they sinned, they disobeyed the command of God, therefore sin entered the world. And from that point, every generation went through, and it got more evil, more wicked, more despicable, uh, more, you know, whatever you want to call it. Noah's the only one who God looks at his life and says that he's righteous. He's living a right lifestyle, one that honors him. So God tells Noah, build a boat. I'm going to send a flood. So Noah, not knowing really what a boat is or what rain is, he begins building this boat that we call an ark. And after a long, after decades of building this boat, the flood comes and the only eight people who survive, who are living in the ark, is Noah, his wife, Noah and his wife's three sons and their three wives. Now, they didn't have three wives each. They had one wife, okay? So it's, that's really important. One, for spiritual reasons, and two, for mathematical reasons. So more the first one, but where I'm going with the math one is also important. So Noah is building this ark for decades, and his community is passing by, making fun of him, asking him what's going on. And Noah is talking about the God of creation wants you to stop breaking his heart, stop disobeying his commands, and come to him and be in relationship with him. That is what Noah is saying. He's trying to get people in his community who he desperately cares about to turn from their evil ways, their, their ways of sin, into a life where God had created them and created us to live, which is freedom in, in God, in, in this God that, he, that, uh, that created us and wants us and wants to have a relationship with us. Now, through that whole flood, because not one person of the community changed their minds, there were only eight people who survived, okay? One plus one plus three plus three. That's eight. So when we read this here, Peter is referring to one of the great people of faith and how even when he could control what he could control, as much as he could do, he couldn't control anyone else. And the only people who survived were the eight that were on the boat. Okay? So that's really important to keep in mind too. Let's finish the chapter. 
Verse 19, so he went and preached to the spirits in prison, those who disobeyed God long ago when God waited patiently while Noah was building his boat. Only eight people were saved from drowning in that terrible flood. And that water is a picture of baptism, which now saves you not by removing dirt from your body, but as a response to God from a clean conscience. It is effective because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now Christ has gone to heaven. He is seated in the place of honor next to God and all the angels in authority Authorities and powers accept as authority. Peter is speaking out of experience. Remember, Peter was alive when Jesus rose from the ground back to heaven after he hung around 40 days after coming back from the grave. And what does Jesus say as he's going back up to heaven? What the Christian faith calls the Great Commission. He says, What? All authority on heaven and earth has been given to me, period. That's his first thought. Therefore, go in the world, make disciples of nations, baptize them, teach them to obey my commands, and I will be with you to the very end of the age. Exit Mary Martin's Peter Pan up into the ceiling. Okay? Peter is reminding the people here who believe in Jesus that Jesus has all authority in him. And when we give our lives to him, his Holy Spirit comes inside of us. We're made new in him. We don't own the authority, but he gives us the authority so that we can work underneath, be underneath his alignment and his authority so that we can do things in his name and reach the world for Jesus one person at a time. Now, all three of these come underneath the same idea, the same topic, the same reality that Peter's trying to warn the readers as he's seeing the little bubbles come up at the bottom of the pot as he's boiling water. And it's our main point this morning, and it's this. Don't be surprised when people respond. Don't be surprised if people respond. If we are living our life and we're allowing Jesus to transform us from the inside out and we're allowing stuff like this that was written 2,000 years ago to still be living and active in our life today where it's, where it's cutting us, it's pruning us, it's convicting us, it's encouraging us, it's setting us up for success, then there are things that we can learn from it and we can... We can transplant it into our culture today so that when we allow this information to come into our head, we can allow it to seep into our heart and allow, allow the Spirit of God to transform us from the inside out. So how do we learn not to be surprised if people respond in 2019? And I'm going to grossly, grossly put all of the responses into three categories just for the sake of time. First one is this. Don't be surprised if people respond with adversity. Don't be surprised if people respond with adversity. Let me tell you, if we're going to be in context, we've got to make sure that we allow Jesus to define our language. Let me tell you what adversity is not. Adversity is not standing in a church service and singing the right word at the wrong time and feeling like because you left a bad week and you're trying to just connect with Jesus in that moment that he is, that he is allowing you to suffer in church. That is not suffering, okay? Suffering is not sitting in an airplane on a tarmac for 30 minutes because you can't, you can't exercise your freedom to get up and move around about the cabin because there's some airplane that's behind 30 minutes and they want to make sure that people, that airplanes don't collide in the middle of the air. That's not suffering. Okay, suffering isn't when someone at work and you and them are going for the same, uh, same promotion and the same title and you think if you get the title that really you'll get the authority and the influence and, 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 and all of the stuff that you're looking for and fulfillment from a job and the other person gets it and you get home and you slam your hand on the, on the table and say, God, I didn't get the promotion and I didn't get the raise. Why am I suffering? That is not suffering. 
Suffering is when you believe in Jesus and people know you believe in Jesus and they want to inflict harm on you because they don't agree with your spiritual belief. That is suffering. That is spiritual adversity. It's a direct reaction of choosing to follow Jesus and be transformed by him. And in Peter's memory, he remembers Jesus in this moment before he was arrested. I mean, Esther did an amazing job with communion. And, and, and she's, you know, she's saying things word for word. And I'm like, man, she, this, I can't believe this, this is her first time. I do it every week, and I still forget some of the words that Jesus you know, writes down for us to remember. And yet Peter and his friend John, who were both disciples, John writes this interaction down in John 15 right before, Peter, or before Jesus gets arrested, right after the communion thing that we just did. This is what Jesus says. He says, if the world hates you, remember that it hated me first. The world would love you as one of its own if you belonged to it, but you are no longer part of the world. I chose you to come out of the world, so it hates you. Do you remember what I told you? A slave is not greater than the master since they persecuted me naturally. They will persecute you. And if they had listened to me, they would have listened to you. They will do all this to you because of me, for they have rejected the one who sent me. Like Jesus tells us the end of the story. And Jesus doesn't say that people hate you because of you. He says that the world is going to hate you because of me, because of Jesus. And we come back to this and we go, well, Jesus died for my sins, so why should I suffer? Well, because Jesus says right here that a slave or a servant isn't greater than the master. And if the master suffers, then so will the servant. We can't just accept all the positive but reject all the negative, the stuff that we don't like. If we're going to be called children of God, if we're going to receive his grace and his love, we have to receive all of it. Not just the stuff that we think that we like. I mean, Jesus thought that suffering was so important that he mentions it in the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, 34 times. That's high up on the scale of stuff that he talked about. It's important. And I don't know what it looks like on the South Hill in Spokane, in the United States. I, I don't know what it looks like. I can tell you I, I, was, I was somewhere where persecution took place. When I went on a mission trip to India, uh, we found out that a few weeks before that a Catholic priest had been drugged by the back of a truck up and down the road until he died because of his faith. I was in that square, and no one knew about it until afterwards when we remembered the news article that we read about it. We begin imagining what it's like to be drugged up and down the roads that surrounded us as we were inside a private school. I don't know what it's like to be persecuted for my faith, but I, I've heard, I, I've talked to missionaries and I've sat in special meetings where we can't use names and organizations because they've talked about stories of the Taliban ambushing their, uh, their, um, their Range Rovers and their Jeeps and how, and how this missionary that we listened to was really struggling with life because he survived the ambush, but the two other missionaries that he was with in front and behind him both died in the gunfire. I don't know what it's like to experience persecution, but I read stories about what goes on in Central Africa in the Middle East on a regular basis. Like, I'm not saying that we need to suffer for our faith, and if we don't suffer, that, that we're not believers of Jesus. That's not what I'm saying. But what I am saying is, is that we have to understand the context, that these are our brothers and sisters around the world. And sometimes they are doing what, they're, what they can control, and they can't control what other people can control. And so when Peter says, if... 
It doesn't mean that it's straight across, but there is a reality that might take place. That we may have to suffer for our faith. And Peter's saying, don't be surprised. Just don't be surprised. Second thing is this. Don't be surprised if people respond in unbelief. Don't be surprised if people respond in unbelief. I mean, what if we have to, 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 if someone comes and asks us about our faith, does Peter actually tell us the answer? Yeah, he does. I mean, how does he tell us the answer? He says, well, if someone asks you for your faith, first of all, you look at them in the eye and you tell them that they're going to burn in hell. And then you use cutting and intimidating words. And then you remind them at the end of the time that you're better than they are. And in their hopelessness, when they think they've hit rock bottom, you just remind them that, that they haven't hit rock bottom and that it can get worse, but they need to give their life to Jesus so they don't suffer in the pits of hell. Oh, wait, no, 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 no. What the, how does Peter tell us to share the gospel of Jesus that's transforming our life? He says, have a plan. Which, isn't it weird that Peter's like the ultimate anti-plan guy? I mean, we've talked about Peter for weeks. This guy didn't think before he spoke. Yet what's the very thing that Peter's telling us to do? Think before we speak. Are you kidding me? This is the beauty of the gospel. That a guy that didn't master what he's asking us to do is still asking us to do it anyway. And there's grace for us to do it as he's trying to learn how to think before he speaks. But he says, think before you speak. He says, have a plan. Be ready. He says, be gentle and be respectful. He says, when you, pre when you speak, have a clear conscience. What would it look like, church, if we began doing that? Not just we, but what would it look like if we were the trailblazers of, of, of telling people and sharing our faith the way Peter is telling us to and not with intimidation and judgment? We would see the third type, which I'll get to in a moment. But if people hear our faith and they don't respond, we have to remember that we can only control what we can control and that we have to let them be responsible for how they respond to the gospel of Jesus. We can't carry the weight of the world on our shoulders when we can barely carry the weight of our world on our shoulders. So be, control what you can control. And if people don't respond, and they respond with unbelief, okay, our hearts will break. Maybe there'll be another opportunity to share, but we can't control how they respond. So don't be surprised if they respond in that way. Don't, re don't be surprised if they respond with adversity. Don't be surprised if they respond in unbelief. And lastly, don't be surprised if they respond with belief. Like you share your story. You share Jesus. And, you, and, and they say, oh, well, that's interesting. How did that play out in your life? And, and you're thinking, wait a minute. You mean you want me to actually, you mean you actually are receiving what I'm sharing? I don't know if I can talk anymore. You should come to church on Sunday and let my pastor do it all for you. No, 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 no. No, they're asking you for a reason because you're preaching the gospel with your actions and then when necessary, you're using words. That you're preaching the gospel and the person at work or at school is saying, hey, what is going on? Why? You should have a really bad attitude after that happens, but you have a great attitude. Why are you not down? Why do you not feel like you're suffering? Why do you feel like bad things are happening to you when, when, when you don't deserve it? Why are you so joy? What is going on? What is inside of you? What is transforming you? What is it? I like something about you that I don't have. Share it with me because I want to respond and live the same way that you're responding in the way that you're living. And in that moment, what do we do? Let me tell you what you should do. You should be you. You should be you. Because baby, there's only one of you. That's the fun of you. He, he, he. Ho, ho, ho. For those of you who don't know, that's the new Taylor Swift song, so. Thank you for laughing. You're now my best friends. 
See, the, the thing, I'll just open my heart really briefly because I'm looking at the timer and I know where I'm at. People, they, even after the first service, they came up to me and they said, oh, Brandon, good message. Oh, I loved it. Oh, it spoke. Oh, good message. One of the greatest messages, one of the greatest sermons that you've ever preached. Oh, I've never heard you. I've never heard anybody preach like that before. I've never heard that topic before. And I, I'm really thankful I am. But I'll be honest with you. Sure, I have title of pastor in my description. That means, that doesn't mean Jack. I mean, the people who are coming to you and they're asking you how you live your life and the faith that you believe, and you're thinking, man, what did Michael say last Sunday? How did he phrase it? He's a pastor. He knows things really, really well. Or, man, Esther did such a great job with communion. Brandon talked about suffering. Boy, that was a real pick-me-up on a Sunday. That, you know, I'm really glad I went to church then. And, but what did he say? I really wish, you know what? If people ask you about your faith, just be you. And I'll tell you, as a pastor, the best sermons I've ever preached and the best sermons I will ever preach, not one of them will ever be here. It will always be right here. This is what makes you a pastor. This does not make you a pastor. This does not make you a pastor. This does not make you a pastor. This makes you a pastor. And when you're not surprised that people respond because they see Jesus inside of you and they begin trans, they see you transforming from the inside out. You're not perfect like Peter's not perfect, but they see something in you and they sit down next to you and they start asking you questions. That's the greatest sermon is one where there's no notes in front of you and you can just pray in your brain, oh God, help me because I'm not sure how this is going to turn out. Those are the best sermons from the best pastors in the history of the known world. And you can be a part of it. Because pastor just means that you're influencing people in the direction of Jesus. And if you're willing to do that, you're a pastor. So please stop romanticizing about what goes on here. This is an amazing time that we get to be, not because of who's behind the mic, but because we get to be a family and we get to encourage each other and we get to build relationship and we get to say, you know what? I need to learn to not be surprised when people respond to me in adversity and people respond to me with unbelief. But man, I don't wanna be surprised when people respond in their belief and they want to give their life to Jesus because there's grace, because there's forgiveness, because there's renewal, because there's hope, because there's mercy, because his love conquers all things, because all authority on heaven and earth is in him, and he uses it, and he pours it out through us into people who need to know who he is. So church, so real life, I'm asking you, you don't need a description to be a pastor. You just need to share your faith and pray for people and ask them to come to faith. And when they ask you why you are who you are, you begin to preach a gospel of Jesus at a table where it connects directly with them. Don't be surprised if people respond. I'm gonna close by reading an excerpt from a devotion from the YouVersion app that some of you are using. It says, members of the early church endured prison, beatings, exposure to death, stoning, shipwreck, sleeplessness, hunger, thirst, and nakedness as a result of proclaiming Jesus as Lord. Instead of quitting, they rejoiced when they suffered for Jesus. Most of us have never been flogged for our faith. We shouldn't feel guilty that we have endured that kind of persecution. Rather, we should be challenged to stand up in our current circumstances. God placed us in this time, in this place, 
so his name might be glorified now. Are we boldly sharing Jesus' message in every area of our lives, or are we hiding behind apathy and comfort? The reward of a life spent living boldly for Jesus far outweighs any temporary consequences we may endure. Who knows what the reper repercussions of sharing Jesus in your school, your workplace, or your family will be. But we can be sure that whatever we face, Jesus is with us. In any situation, we can boldly share the gospel. What this author is saying is what Peter is saying. Have unshakable faith in Jesus. That doesn't mean don't question. It doesn't mean don't second guess. It doesn't mean don't dig deeper. Jesus wants us to do those things. But as we do those things, would we have unshakable faith in Jesus? And that is Peter's heart. That is Jesus' heart. That is our heart for us this morning. Would you stand with me? I want to pray for us real briefly, and then we'll get into our worship time. If you're here this morning and you would like prayer, maybe you grew up in a church or a background where um, there was fear that was preached. Maybe there, you're from a background where you're afraid to step into what Jesus has for you because you're afraid of suffering and we're going to have a team up here that wants to pray with you we've been we've been praying for this moment every week that we would pray for people maybe there's some maybe you're here this morning like i could care less about what you just preached i've got so much in my life i need someone to pray with me about what's going on okay we want to do that too please come forward and pray with us if you're here this morning and you've never given your life to Jesus, but through this message about his hope and his, his identification that he gives us, what he gives us, his Holy Spirit, he transforms us, he gives us the life that he created, that he wants us to live through transformation. You want to give your life to Jesus for the first time? We want to partner with you. We want to come alongside your journey. And there's a team in the back that will give you shorts and shirts and a towel and uh, we love to baptize you just as Peter was talking about baptism, that it's not a bath, it's not removing dirt, but it's a, a, a representation, it's a partnership where we are associating with the death and resurrection of Jesus and we can do that here in our tank off on the side this morning. We want to celebrate with you. And maybe you're here this morning and you're just like, I just don't have courage to share my faith. I don't know when to share it. I don't have the words to share it awesome come forward and let us pray with you because this team isn't perfect but would we would you allow us to partner with you and pray that the god of courage would give you courage so that when the opportunity comes you don't have to be like catastrophically weird you just have to be supernaturally you without the taylor swift song so would you bow your head and close your eyes with me? Father, I want to lift our body to you. And I want to ask you that you would give us courage where courage needs to be given. Where transformation would be given where it needs to be given. Lord, would you encourage those who feel like that you are helping, that, 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 that you are inside them and you're doing so much in them that they want to bust out at the seams, but they feel like because they're not a pastor and they're not on a stage and they're not on a mic that they don't have anywhere to share it. And Lord, would you give them the creative understanding to know that there are people in their life right now who need to know what you're doing in their life because they want the same thing. Lord, would you empower us to be pastors? Would you empower us to not be surprised? Would we not be driven by fear, but would you give us courage and have unshakable faith in you? Lord, we love you, and we want you to encourage us to help us be the men and women of God that you've created us to be. So, Father, empower us now.